this week with the sport trial. So probably one of the most uh, well-known papers to, to pretty much everyone here. Um, so I'm not going to hit the smaller points. We're just going to kind of move through the bigger things so we can have a, a good discussion at the end. So this paper, um, you know, the, the main objectives here were to study a group of spondylolisthesis patients that had radiographic stenosis with either um, uh, with either a couple things we'll talk about in a moment. But the long and short of it is they need 12 weeks of symptoms, and we're going to look at their PROs to see whether surgery or not having surgery are better. Unique things about this study is that they wanted to set up an observational group that patients got to decide their treatment with their surgeon, and then the randomized group where you're randomized to either continue non-operative care on top of 12 weeks or um, having, obviously, surgical intervention. Okay. So in order to do this, they wanted to enroll 150 people in each of the arms uh, for the randomized portion and then have an observational cohort that was about the same size as the uh, randomized portion. So like I said, they're looking for claudication or ridiculous symptoms and needed to have uh, uh, radiographic stenosis. And we didn't want to include any of the ismic spondy patients in this. They also needed to be deemed a potential surgical candidate by their doctor. Um, and then for the surgical group, it's going to be either a laminectomy and a fusion or just a laminectomy, what type of fusion and whether or not they had a fusion was completely up to their provider. Um, and then for the non-surgical group, it was what they called standard non-operative care, uh, standard in that it's what the doctor would have done, not standardized across the study. And that includes the 12 weeks prior to being in the study, as well as uh, after they're randomized to that group. Primary outcomes, as you can see there, SF36, uh, bodily pain and physical function, as well as ODIs. Uh, you can see the time frames they planned on recording that. And as you now know, they recorded that for much longer. Um, uh, of interesting note, you know, the patients, when they were enrolled in this, were told they could either be in the observational or the randomized portion of the study and kind of got to choose that. And then if they chose randomized, we're obviously then randomized to one of those two uh, arms. So we move on to the results. We ended up with 304 patients on the randomized side. Uh, that's a, uh, 159 got randomized to surgery, 145 to non-op, so pretty close to similar there. And then as you all know, kind of the big controversial part about this paper is the crossover uh, kind of one of the reasons we don't randomize surgical issues very much because of this problem. So, uh, and it's really just a statistical problem. So what's happened is in the surgical group out of the 159 patients, you know, 57% had surgery at a year, 64% had surgery at two years, which means 36% of people didn't have the intervention they were randomized to. And on the non-operative side, 45 or 49% of people, sorry, at two years, crossed over and had surgery anyway. Um, for the observational cohort, the 303 that you're seeing there, 97% of the people that said, I want to have surgery when they decided this with their doctor ultimately had surgery within a year. Um, and on the non-operative side, 17% still had surgery at a year and 25% at two years. So still some crossover, but obviously not as much as the uh, randomized arm. So the problem came in the data analysis. Their issue was whether or not to uh, look at this as intention to treat or as treated. I'll, I'll honestly tell you, you know, when I first read this paper, I was, I think, at the end of medical school, and I didn't understand what those terms were. So now, you know, it makes a lot of sense to all of us, but if you intend to operate on this group of 159 people and you only did that on 64% of them, but you count all of those people's data towards the operative side, it just doesn't make any sense. You're not answering your question of whether or not surgery is better than no surgery. You would just be answering the question of whether or not being randomized to the surgical group somehow made you better than not. Um, so although the randomization is done to remove multiple layers of bias um, in medicine. That's kind of why we do that in every paper. They determined that in this situation to best answer our question with the data that we have, which for all intents and purposes is the best data we're gonna get on a study like this, we should instead look at the intervention they had performed and group those people together. So we grouped together the people that had surgery in the randomized group, either they were randomized to surgery or they were randomized to non-op and they crossed over to surgery, or they were in the observational group and had surgery, were all counted the same, and then obviously all the non-ops were counted the same. When they did that in the as-treated group, that's where they found that surgery was 
uh, was better. Um, and this is, there's not a lot of pictures in my presentation. This one I think is really helpful. And really the only takeaway is the, the non-filled in circles and squares. That's when we take a look at people based on how they were randomized, like the color hat that we gave them and not what they actually did. And then the solid uh, triangle and squares are obviously where they are when we look at them as, as in the as treated group. Um, and of course that gives us here uh, statistically significant data. So takeaways for me uh, from this in terms of how does this affect my practice? Obviously it's a foundational paper that was uh, published prior to me uh, getting into residency. So it's kind of been a part of, of who I and the other fellows are, but really says to me, if someone has spondylolisthesis, they've tried non-operative management and they're an otherwise good operative candidate, that in a lot of situations, they're going to be better off having surgery than continuing non-operative management after what's in this case, 12 weeks, um, if they meet the criteria for this study, which would be spondy. So, you know, whether or not you fuse, this study doesn't answer, um, doesn't answer what type of fusion. There's other studies that have attempted to do that. So in my practice, a spondylolisthesis patient that's potentially operative, continuing to have symptoms, I would likely end up offering them uh, surgery if they failed non-operative management. We can um, go to questions now or comments. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hear you guys super well. I, I can only see like five people at the bottom. So if they have questions, great. If it's anyone else, I don't know if you guys want to type it. I can see uh, Dr. Chapman, though. This is uh, Izzy Lieberman. Uh, John, well, well presented. The paper itself, I think, really speaks to the issue of spondylolisthesis being a structural abnormality. And we've relied so heavily on the patient reported outcomes. And quite frankly, they don't reflect as well the lack of activity or the inactivity that people may uh, resort to because of the pain. So you rate a pain scale, you see them on day one, they say, yeah, my, pails, my pain is six out of 10 when I walk. You see them six months later, they say, my pain is three out of 10. But then when you ask them, are you still walking? They say, no, well, I'm not walking. So that, that's what I think this paper really tells us that spondylolisthesis is a structural abnormality and to maintain function, we need to give it a structural solution. You know, th this is probably one of the most quoted papers because it was one of the few very, very early papers in spine that was truly randomized. But as you elucidated the problem with the as treated and treated, you know, raised a lot of issues. So there were a lot of complaints when the study was being done. We said, God, they spent millions and millions of dollars from this grant they got from the government. And, and what did we really learn that we didn't know before? But it still remains a classic that I think every fellow should really know inside and out. And, uh, you know, subsequently had a number of other papers showing again that operative intervention does make a difference. And um, just for a little background for the Seattle folks, We've chosen two classics and then three um, newer articles. So any other discussion before we move on to the next one? We're running a little bit behind, but we're okay. Yeah, we reviewed this uh, early in the year as one of the uh, mandatory classics. For me, the main thing is that this is the study that ends all uh, prospective randomized clinical trials, the conventional uh, scientific uh, trials and surgical specialties, at least in the USA. It's very clear that US Americans don't like to be randomized, unlike Canadians, for instance, uh, or dutiful Europeans. Uh, and what patients want, they shall get. That's what I really learned from this study. Uh, the, the main other problems, this is a great uh, consortium of people, and Jim Weinstein is an amazing leader. But uh, the, the problem is, again, that uh, we're really not capturing spondylolisthesis in its various uh, variants, such as the perception or neurogenic application. So what Izzy said, I want to reflect, the subtleties of spondylolisthesis are substantial. And for instance, that knee-jerk reflex that any degenerative spondylolisthesis needs to be fused is clearly one of those quagmires that we're still suffering from. So uh, I think we do require a lot more sophistication. And I do think that uh, going forward, a PRCT uh, is really not possible and justifiable in surgery anymore because people Patients, as well as doctors, will do what they want to do uh, pretty much and uh, not oblige to some treatment regimen. So that's all I got for right now. Thank you. Thanks, Jens. All right. 
Alex, you want to go on the next one unless there's any other questions? Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Satin. I'm going to be presenting the uh, 2011 European Spine Journal article, Spinal Pelvic Sagittal Balance of Spinal Elastesis, a Review and Classification. Um, this project was su supported by the Spinal Deformity Study Group and funded by uh, Medtronic. This is a well-cited article written by experts from Canada and France on sagittal alignment and spinal pelvic parameters that highlights the importance of assessing and interpreting spinal pelvic balance in the setting of developmental or acquired stress fracture spinal elastesis. Um, some prior studies uh, had identified and characterized distinct patterns of altered sacro-pelvic orientation and sagittal balance in uh, patients with L5-S1 spinal elastesis. Um, these findings resulted in the spinal deformity study group classifications and the authors in this paper illustrate its clinical relevance to guide decision making um, with a focus on reduction of high grade slips and to, to better clarify uh, the, a rationale for that. So I'll quickly review some background information and then get into how um, the classification as well as the information um, in this paper, you know, will have affected our practices. So prior work on uh, low-grade spondylolisthesis identified three distinct uh, patient groups based on pelvic incidence. You had normal, low, and then patients with high pelvic incidence. Um, patients with high pelvic incidence and sacral slope have an increased shear stress at the lumbosacral junction, and you get this shear-type spondy that you could see on the left. Um, and then patients with a lower uh, PI and sacral slope have a um, impingement of the posterior elements of L5 between L4 and S1, and they get this uh, nutcracker effect on the pars that ultimately leads to their uh, spinal elastesis. Um, in contrast, patients with high-grade uh, spondies, you know, grade three and higher, have been found to have either a balanced or unbalanced pel pelvis. Um, balanced patients have a high sacral slope and low pelvic tilt, while unbalanced patients have that classic retroverted pelvis and vertical sacrum corresponding to a low sacral slope and high pelvic tilt. And then a portion further of these patients um, with a retroverted pelvis have a global sagittal imbalance as well. Um, so these findings led to the um, six types in the uh, deform spinal deformity study group classification. Um, first, looking at the uh, grade of the slip and then the various pelvic parameters that we just discussed. Um, here are uh, radiographic rest representations of the six different types. Um, you know, the, the low grade, uh, there's low PI, normal PI, and then high PI. And then in the high grade, you have balanced and unbalanced, uh, you know, pelvises, and then further patients with uh, global sagittal imbalance. So for me, um, you know, and, I, and this is obviously a very a classic article, but there are a number of important takeaways um, from this article uh, for, for me, and then I think some, you know, things to reflect on um, nine or 10 years later. Um, so patients with L5-S1 uh, spinal elastesis are clearly a heterogeneous group um, with various adaptations of their posture, and this needs, I think, to be kept in mind um, when determining their treatment. And I think looking at slip grade is obviously important, but you also want to understand the sacropelvic morphology and balance and uh, that should be clearly uh, considered in the treatment algorithm. Um, as patients reach their maximal attainable compensatory lordosis, they begin to retrovert their pelvis to main maintain balance. And then when they reach the limit of that retroversion, they develop sagittal trunk imbalance. So, um, you know, based on the author's recommendations, patients, those types five and six, so the high grade slips with retroverted pelvises are clearly people who would benefit from reduction techniques to improve the balance and shape of the lumbar spine. I think one of the benefits for me is that it, this paper provides a systematic way to evaluate um, these patients and provides a rationale to re reduce and realign the deformity in order to restore global spinal pelvic balance and improve the biomechanical environment for fusion. And, I, and then the final thing is in 2020, I think, you know, a legacy of a paper like this is that I think we consistently incorporate these metrics into our decision making now. Um, you know, in 2020, surgeons performing lumbar fusions for spinal elastesis pay careful attention to the restoration of pelvic parameters and balance in addition to um, whether or not they should reduce the spinal elastesis. So, you know, I, this wasn't 
a, a, a level one study like John presented. It was at times seemed almost like an expert opinion, but um, you know, it clearly fits with the established principles and practices, and I think remains an important paper in the literature. Well, I'll make a, a comment here again. It's Izzy Lieberman. Uh, Alex, well presented. You highlighted the important things in this article. Uh, from a clinical perspective, after many, many years of trying to deal with this and thinking how, how we are improving over time, what Rusely and uh, LaBelle pointed out to us is those grade five and six, or the type fives and sixes with the high grade slip and that retroverted pelvis. No one really appreciated that until they pointed it out. And from a clinical perspective, that's what I find the absolute toughest thing to do in, in spinal surgery. As, as hard as I try to get that pelvis back underneath, it somehow just doesn't ever line up the way I had envisioned it to. And that kind of makes me think that there's more to it than just the retroverted pelvis. And again, we've got to look at the, what uh, Virginie Lafage and Frank Schwab had, had labeled as the chain of correlation. We've got to figure out what's happening up at the neck, up at the thoracic spine and the pelvis and figuring out where that balance point is. Because maybe not every one of these high grade slips needs to be reduced completely. So again, we need more information on that over time. Um, Izzy, so, oh, sorry. Izzy, I was going to say that you know this points out this points out the fact that we everybody really should have an EOS. They should have the full body uh, scan or X ray so that we can truly see the alignment. Because I had the same thoughts as you that you know we see lots of these spondylolisthesis and you know I don't do deformity, but I've seen all these different types and we do sort of the standard treatment. We try to reduce it, restore the disc height. Uh, try to you know restore some balance there, but unless you see their overall alignment, there may be some people who just have a retroverted pelvis, and that's the way they are. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the exact point. We we, we still struggle with. Uh, thank you for selecting this. We still struggle with not having an EOS here, which is highly frustrating for us. Um, uh, so we still have a full body whatever Siemens uh, imaging. The, the question that I have for you is, uh, how does this affect actual surgery beyond trying to restore a physiologic lumbosacral angulation? Would you, for instance, see a need for inclusion of more lumbar vertebra to try to restore uh, physiologic lumbopelvic parameters? Number one. Number two, would you do a more aggressive upper sacral dome osteotomy, for instance, or add pelvic fixation to try to have a more solid foundation uh, to turn the pelvis? So that's my question to my colleagues. So from purely anecdotal, from years of doing this, what, what I have found is it's actually the hips and the pelvis is what you really have to assess on this. Getting more fixation in the pelvis, I think, is an absolute must because of the lever arm and the forces to even try to get some kind of reduction through it. The other thing to look at is the hip joints. And over the years, I've actually done a couple um, anterior hip releases and psoas releases in an, in an attempt to try to get these patients more balanced after I thought that I had them balanced and, and those didn't quite work out as well as, as I'd, I'd anticipated either. So there's more things that we still have to look at before we can say, yeah, let's add more levels um, to this. Uh, we still don't know the answer, but uh, LaBelle and Rusely pointed this out to us and, and got us now thinking about it. So I think that's a good thing. All right. Any other questions? Anybody? Just so you know that we have uh, the legally permitted maximum of 10 people in the room here, and we're all socially distanced. Everybody's nodding their head. So you're being watched even though you don't don't see it. But uh, here's, for instance, Rod right next to me, and he's scratching his beard, and he says hi. Oh, very nice. <laughs>
All right. So I think no other questions right now. Yeah, we, uh, we, we hopefully have our radiologists start doing this more and more. Some of our radiologists are very good at uh, measuring this. My question is still uh, the future observer reliability. When I measure those and uh, remeasure the things that our radiologists have measured and then from other colleagues, I find an interesting discrepancy, uh, which uh, back with these studies, I, I still think that the actual reliability coefficient would be probably below 0.6 or something like that. So the kappa for that would not be very high, uh, I, uh, I assume. Any other comments, Izzy, or anybody else, any of the fellows? This is going to change the way you practice. You're going to think about it. Alex? Yeah, as I was saying, I think, you know, it's certainly part of, um, you know, our, our thought process. And I think, you know, some of the other work and that we've, you know, people have done looking at, you know, there's a dynamic component to a lot of these um, sagittal factors and the pelvic profile. So I think, you know, obviously um, getting a standing x-ray is important, but it's also just a quick snapshot in time. So I think, you know, the way we're thinking about this is continually evolving and um, allow us to better treat treat patients and you know in regards to selecting levels and going for the pelvis and so you know i think the algorithm will just continue to to you know be enriched okay all right shall we go on the next article good morning everyone so i have the article artificial intelligence for the treatment of uh, lumbar spinal thesis so this was an article out of 2019, a little bit of background. Um, as the uh, population increases, more patients will be seeking treatment for this condition. Uh, most of these patients are treated with a fusion. However, there are some recent studies that have come out that show that some of these patients can be treated with decompression alone. So decompression versus decompression plus fusion has been a uh, source of debate for a number of years. And then AI technology may be used to predict which of these patients will develop delayed instability. Uh, a little bit of background in terms of decompression versus decompression first versus uh, instrumented fusion. Herkowitz in 1991 um, found that 96% of patients uh, treated with decompression and fusion had good results up to three years. The downside of this article uh, was that it was non-randomized. Uh, and then in 2016, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, they uh, found that patients with grade one spondees treated with decompression plus fusion had superior outcomes up to uh, four years. Fish run in 97, uh, on the flip side, patients uh, with decompression and fusion plus instrumentation, they had higher fusion rates, but similar outcomes at two years. And then another study in 2014 really no difference in the, uh, the clinical outcomes with the addition of fusion at two, at two years also. So that, that begs to question whether we need to just decompress these patients or at uh, posterior lateral or instrumented fusion uh, patients with spinal thesis. So in terms of data collection, the article talked about the NIS database. This is the largest uh, available healthcare database to examine trends in healthcare complication rates and hospital charges, as well as the SIDS database. Um, and most states are kind of using this database now. The problem with these databases are that they do have some limitations. Uh, they, they lack indications for surgery. There may be some inaccuracy in, in the data extraction, as well as um, in terms of patient reported outcomes. So this led to the uh, clinical registries, uh, Asher, uh, he found that 82% of patients uh, with using a clinical registry that treated with uh, fusion or decompression had uh, really good outcomes. Then comes uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, another word for this is machine learning. And essentially this is using computer systems to perform tasks that um, normally re re require human um, you know, tests. So Netflix is an example of this. They use uh, predictive uh, technology to determine which DVDs and which movies to recommend to the uh, users. It's using Google as well as uh, Tesla. So in terms of AI and spine surgery, you know, it requires a number of different things. It requires large amounts of healthcare data. 
that is collected and stored. Uh, it requires computer logarithms to approximate the conclusion from this data without human input. It requires uh, pattern recognition, recognition, basically using uh, several surgeons to make sure they see the same thing, and then you develop uh, certain logarithms uh, based off of this. This is uh, just an example of a uh, patient who uh, had a grade one spinal thesis and had some stenosis, and they asked uh, 13 surgeons would they perform decompression without fusion or decompression with fusion. And most of the uh, surgeons uh, favored decompression without fusion. And it was noted in this article that um, once most surgeons kind of agree upon one thing, then the outcomes are usually uh, better in those uh, situations. So in, in terms of this article, what I took away from it is that uh, AI has already been used in other applications of our, our daily lives. Um, I, I think this is a, you know, next kind of technology that we can use in spine surgery when we're trying to make decisions in terms of uh, when to operate on the patient or what particular operation is best. It's important to uh, create and maintain surgical databases, which can provide all of this data to uh, help us make these decisions and then hopefully improve outcomes. Um, some downsides of this article is essentially just a review article. Uh, they had a lump uh, mixture of different uh, fusions plus posterior lateral fusions versus instrumentation. So it made it a little bit difficult to kind of interpret uh, kind of the results of when all the articles are kind of uh, intermixed. But, um, you know, I think it's something maybe we can use AI in terms of cervical myelopathy or central cord syndrome to see which patients would be best treated with an operation. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Izzy or, uh, <clears throat> or Jens, the uh, spinal, your deformity study group has in certain ways been using AI, you know, you call it predictive analytics, but I think that's a very, very exciting area. It, we have it in deformity, we just don't have it in the other areas. What do you think about that? So it is very exciting. It's exceptionally exciting, and it's the way of the future. We're going to be learning more, and, and we're witnessing predictive analytics right now with the current pandemic, how we've got all these individuals that are taking all this data and trying to forecast what's going to happen and who should be treated, who shouldn't be treated. So it's here. It's important. The one issue that I think we still are uh, grappling with in spine surgery is diagnosis. It's been mentioned a couple times already this morning that not all spondylolistheses are the same. You've got the neurological involvement, you've got the structural involvement, you've got the functional ability of the patient, uh, you've got the expectations of the patient. So all of these factors still have to come in. And the only way that we're going to parse out those factors is more and more patients in a database and somehow coming up with diagnostic criteria that we can all agree upon. I've been involved in four different database projects and the biggest stumbling block we've had with each one of them and why each one has failed is because we couldn't agree on the diagnostic criteria. And Jens, you, you know a lot about that. What, what do you think? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so the, the issues are, what are the relevant, critical, least number of data points that we can all consistently identify and uh, uh, register? And uh, that's the crux of the matter, as you said. Otherwise, you get the counter of uh, artificial intelligence that's called garbage in, garbage out. And um, that's a very common problem that we have with all of our registries. So the predictive analytics will require, for instance, that we'll probably have a more automated reading of our images, for instance, uh, through a computer, i.e. EOS images will do the balance measurements. 
uh, quantifying patients' pain experience and function is the other big nirvana spot that we still don't have. So uh, right now, as we're, for instance, trying to triage myelopathy, I heard you're doing a myelopathy patient. Uh, it is really interesting to see the difference of interpretations of myelopathy and progression, and also seeing how patients experience progression of myelopathy suddenly on a far more basis as they're fearing that the care may be denied. So a lot of subject in there. Um, what I'm afraid of basically big government will take over big data and say these kind of population groups do well or do not well. We have that in our own state, and Rod, maybe I'll pass the microphone to Rod and turn the camera towards him. We were co-authors on a study here in Washington State where we saw that workman's comp patients, for instance, with fusions, do really badly in our JAMA article. Right, Rod? No, it's true. I mean, um, how you interpret the data and who's using it for what purpose um, is uh, really important. And, in our state, I mean, you could see, unfortunately, actually, actually both Medicaid um, and uh, um, Workman's Comp did horrible. You know, we had people with one level of um, laminectomies that became disabled for life. So um, I think those all need to be considered when you're using AI and data. Yeah, uh, guys, if I can just pop in. Quasi Boa, um, one of our uh, neurosurgical colleagues said, Regarding AI, how do we know if the expert opinion is usually is truly the correct one? Think of some other diseases where we've had paradigm shifts, even in other fields of medicine. And, and the other that leads to the comment that you know, it's one thing to use predictive analytics for the us as part of the decision making process, but just like um, standard cookbook algorithms, the danger of predictive analytics is that people other than the caring uh, physician is going to use those to dictate care. Um, so, you know, you have a, a field of experts who's making a <coughs> publishing statistical analysis, and then maybe a, a board of directors or a hospital administrator is going to be telling us how to treat a particular patient based on that. So, for me, I, I see that there is some evil uh, in the development of what we think is going to be a user friendly system that may turn out to bite us in the butt. We talked about that spondylolisthesis, both in diagnostic as a heterogeneous population. And then I think there's a paper coming out about minimally invasive T lifts or spondylolisthesis. So there's, you know, half a dozen at least different operations for it if you decide it needs an operation or even a fusion at all. I have a couple of questions. Number one is can we even, you know, and, and Izzy was talking about and, and Jen, about how we can correct the whole spine from looking at head to toe with the EO scans. But way before that, we had papers from, from Lee Wiltsey talking about uninstrumented in situ posterolateral fusion for spondies. And many of those young people had good results if you believe that they have good results in terms of their uh, discount, all those old Wiltsey papers on in situ spondylolisthesis, now that we can correct everything. That's my first question. And then my second question is that actually to, to Jens, um, last week you presented a case, a deformity case, multiple revisions, and they had one level of stenosis with spondy, and you, you did a decompression and threw a coflex in there, which I see we're not going to talk about today. But my question regarding that, and again, these are for people that, that do coflexes, and, and I know that Rick Jack, myself, uh, and uh, I think Jessica's on, she does them. Um, the argument we get back are those are the spondies that maybe don't need anything done at all, but you're not saving them a fusion. So a couple things to talk about. Who'd you direct it to, Scott? Anybody? Well, the, the Lucy question to either Jens or Izzy, and then the the, the Coflex question to Jens, because I don't think Izzy does Coflex, but I see Jens did one in a big case. But so, yes. So just to set the record straight, I, I do revise coflexes. Uh, but other than that, with respect to the Wiltsey papers, uh, remember when those papers were written, the outcome parameters were different than the outcome parameters that we collect today. And I think it also goes back to the point I tried to raise earlier about 
do these patients really need to be corrected? Because the in situ fusions, typically they didn't get much correction. They were just stabilizing it, preventing the listhesis from going further. So I don't think we can come up with an answer to your question, but I do believe Wilsey's data. I just don't know that it's applicable today. Well, I think real quick on the the paper that Dr. Blumenthal was talking about in the use grade one spondies, you know, I would think, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in the MIST lift paper. Um, I think what we're really doing is fixing the instability and not so much decompression. And so I think those patients that had even open posterior lateral fusions did well. Um, I think it's probably because their instability was, uh, you know, prevented uh, rather than, like you said, actually putting in bigger cages or um, fixing alignment. So. Okay, Jens, last comment. Uh, very briefly, so these are great points. Uh, so much to talk about, so little time. Uh, number one, I think underrated in most of these radiographic studies or technique studies is uh, neurologic uh, function and neurologic integrity. And what patients really are challenged by so often is uh, success of an effective neurologic decompression without destabilizing the spine and sustaining that over as long as possible. So that's that's one thing that I frequently see overlooked and when we try to interpret uh, phenomenology, meaning success or the beauty of an x-ray or a fusion or a reconstructive surgery in general. Number two, uh, where I see the uh, huge opportunity in especially Zohar's uh, uh, efforts, and again, we're doing that in a way in a very simple but um, uh, amazing fashion, is trying to coalesce our thoughts into a more structured general pathway. So we kind of, uh, I participated in the myelopathy project with Zohar, and I was one of those opinion people, and the 10 first respondents would kind of basically register then and would simply vote about anterior versus posterior fusion versus laminoplasty, uh, artificial diffusion. It was just fascinating to see how colleagues would think. And I, I do believe that to some degree it trained my brain to try to anticipate what others would think and try to uh, coalesce into something. So uh, this is the fascinating thing for me about these AI exercises that are taking place now. And Zohar has done a great job with that. And I think we're going to participate in this next project formally uh, to try to kind of uh, hit checklists of what matters for this patient most and trying to address those things and always trying to keep our eyes and ears open to identify what do, does matter to patients here and there and now and then adjusting from our armamentarium of surgeries accordingly. Thanks. Jens, great point. I, I think that all this artificial intelligence and everything we shouldn't be afraid of, but we need to be the ones that control it. As you said, the administrators, if they get a hold of it, they don't really care. But it's the physicians who see the patients, know the patients. We need to be the ones making the decisions. So with that, let's go on to the next paper. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting uh, the predictive model uh, for long-term patient satisfaction after Spondy uh, grade one surgery. It's uh, insights from the QOD registry. And uh, once again, my name is Avi Gandhi. I'm one of the fellows here. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, Dejan Spondy is a common cause of low back pain. Um, there's not a whole lot of research predicting um, optimum patient reported outcomes um, after such surgery. And it's important in the context of ACA with delivering value-based healthcare where you have increasing access and quality of healthcare while simultaneously reducing the cost. So there's multiple objectives to value-based healthcare and this is a significant portion of that. Okay, um, in terms of the met there, th this was a um, 12 center, multi-center study with approximately 12 centers involved. Um, the inclusion criteria were patients who had one to two level decompressions or, or one level um, decompression infusion for grade one spondy. And the primary outcome measures were the NAS uh, NASS uh, satisfaction index, which is graded one through four. Uh, one and two, they classified them as being the satisfied group, which is the treatment met by expectations um, at a follow-up of two years. Um, grade two is, I didn't improve much as, a, as I had hoped, but I would undergo the same surgery again. Um, and grade three and four, where the patients were not as satisfied, they did not improve as, as much as they had hoped and would not undergo the same um, uh, procedure. 
and grade four being the worst, they, they were worse off than where they were before the surgery. And as part of the study, they also um, collected a lot of demographic variables, perioperative variables, intraoperative variables, um, from work status, baseline function, baseline um, satisfaction score, smoking, depression, et cetera. And the results were they had approximately out of 100,000 patients in the database, they were able to find 500 that fit the inclusion criteria. 78% uh, had one level decompression infusion, the others had de just decompressions. 82% um, fell in the you know satisfied category, which is a score of one to two on the NAS index and 90, uh, 90 patients, the other 18% fell in the non-satisfied. Uh, so there were no differences between many variables in the, in the study that the, between the two groups. Uh, some of the more prominent uh, demographics in the univariate analysis uh, were age, education did not affect um, the differences in, in satisfaction, uh, medical history, uh, diabetes, anxiety, any sort of comorbidities like that did not affect it as well. Uh, perioperative uh, uh, variables such as Fusion, uh, ASA grade, MIS versus open surgery did not affect it either. But in the univariate analysis, the satisfied patients were more likely to have workers' compensation, surprisingly, and they were employed and working. Um, and, and other variables that were also significant in the satisfied uh, cohort were uh, leg pain, preoperative leg pain being more prominent than back pain. Um, this is just one of, one of the tables in the study um, highlighting uh, how workers' compensation, patients, and employment status had a significant effect on uh, satisfaction. And this is another table kind of highlighting um, a lot of the non uh, perioperative variables, length of stay, discharge disposition, and not being a significant predictor uh, of whether or not patients are going to be satisfied at the two year time point. So after doing uh, the running the univariate analysis, they, you know, for more statistical strength, they ran the multivariate um, analysis and found three variables that were significant um, in terms of predicting satisfaction, which is older patients um, had a odds ratio of 1.57. Employment, once again, um, was significant and, and presence of fusion, actually the history of having a fusion surgery was more predictive as well of post-operative satisfaction. Um, this is just a table kind of highlighting those three, those three variables uh, being the significant predictors. So, I mean, this is the most important slide in this presentation. Basically, um, it's a larger study. Uh, this, the uniqueness of this study is a larger study of predictors using prospectively collected data. Um, you know, the multivariate analysis, uh, the predictors were the older age, employment, uh, working situation, and, and, uh, and the history of having a fusion surgery were the most significant predictors. Um, they talk about how, you know, in other studies uh, in the literature talked about how depression and smoking history uh, impacted negatively the satisfaction uh, of patients uh, postoperatively, but in this study, they didn't find that. And I, and I think going through each variable age, um, I think it's a mixed bag in terms of older age predicting uh, positive outcomes because they cited another study with 3,000 patients uh, for spinal stenosis and uh, that age was actually negatively correlated in that case uh, with satisfaction. And I, I think it's just older people may be more grateful to have something done. Very, and it's also, you, I think in older people would take more precautions in terms of going through the, all of the different facets of non-operative management before we offer them surgery. And, and furthermore, this, uh, the NAS satisfaction index is, is very simplistic uh, relative to other um, grading systems such as promise scores, ODIs. So I think it's not as granular in teasing out why patients are satisfied with a particular surgery. Uh, but the other variable, working in uh, employment, I think that's just a, a choosing, selecting for a pay, subset of patients that are more self-driven uh, and self-motivated to get back to work. So I think that would be something that I would actually implement in my future practice to see, you know, what are their goals ultimately that this patient uh, he or she wants to get back to? Is it to get back to uh, just dealing with ADLs, or is it more to get back to work and kind of contributing uh, more to their to their family from that perspective? Um, and lastly, 
this is uh, the, the variable about fusion, having fusion surgery done, I think that's a little bit misleading because patient does, the study doesn't necessarily talk about the fusion status of these patients at two years. Um, and that's something they could have included in, uh, and they talk about that being a huge limitation of the study. Um, so I think a, a future randomized controlled trial with uh, assessing whether or not they fuse and kind of correlating that with satisfaction would be a lot more helpful um, than this particular variable. Um, and, and, and the other things they could have examined are race, uh, socioeconomic status, which was not examined, and, um, and occupational differences as well. So. Okay, thank you, Abby. <clears throat> you know, it's very interesting. Years ago, we had a published a paper. Uh, we had published a paper. There's a lot of feedback. Something was new for me. Okay, paper on the ten best and the ten worst artificial dissipations. This was. Jack, Scott, and I, and uh, the only variable we found, and we did a multivariate analysis, was whether or not they were working 13 weeks before they had their surgery. So it didn't make a difference how the x-ray looked, and none of the other variables made a difference, and it's just a matter of that they were working. But this also brings up the point that we need more objective outcome analysis or data, and we've done a little bit of this through the Gate Lab, and we're hearing more and more about this, and I'm sure that Izzy will have some comment about that, but... I'm glad you brought that up because <laughs> this this paper really does um, amplify the noise surrounding outcome data in spine surgery. There's so many variables, and a lot of those variables I, I consider noise. Um, they're things that are important, but really, have we made the patient better? Can the patient stand better? Can they walk better? Can they do other things? whether they're working or not. So this is where, and, and I know that uh, um, Rum and Damon and, and um, are on the call with this, but this is really just to, to justify what the work that they're doing in the gate lab, really objectively measuring how our patients are doing before and after intervention. Because that's a spine surgeon, what's, what's the most important to us. Are the patients really better? And we've got examples of patients that we look at their x-ray and think, ah, you know, we just didn't quite do the best job with them. And the patients are ecstatic and their gait lab results are no better at all. And then we've got patients that are absolutely depressed and debilitated and still can't do anything, but their x-rays look great and the gait lab results look great. They're walking further. They're definitely standing tall. So the, the noise has to be parsed out and taken into account. So, Izzy, where does the noise start and where does it end? It's our mind, it's our head. So one of our former partners really educated uh, us a lot about this. Uh, it is so amazing how there are some patients who do really well and uh, others don't. And again, many of the variables we're trying to chase after. For instance, when I see older age, that's obviously somewhat counterintuitive, but it also tells me that these are these older baby baby boomers, uh, some of depression era people, and they've gone through really hard times and they're basically adapters. They have a high grit factor. That's the new other thing. So I think that one of the most important things that all of us kind of learn in our practices is to try to see a patient differently and understand how well they'll respond to certain treatment. And uh, that for me is one of those biggest learning points clinically in terms of predicting who will do well or not by not just the x-ray or not just my physical examination findings directly, but how they interact with me, how they respond. And moreover, if there's, God forbid, a complication, how they'll rebound from that, how they'll deal with it. So this is where the psychosocial aspect of medicine comes into spine surgery and is such an integral part of our outcomes and our results. Thanks. Scott, did you want to say something? Your, your speaker's on. Oh, no, no, I'm good. I'm having trouble okay. controlling myself, so um, it's just on during the discussion period, but I'll wait for the okay. next paper. All right, any other comments? Jack, anything? 
I think one, one other thing from this article, uh, they kind of lumped a lot of patients who had, uh, you know, posterior spinal fusion, but they didn't break it down in terms of whether they had T-lift, A-lift, whether they had uh, MIS or instrumentation versus non-instrumentation. And we have uh, mentioned some studies that mentioned that patients who have posterior fusion with instrumentation have better outcomes. So I'm not sure if that kind of uh, had some, you know, um, affected the outcomes of the study or not, whether looking at each of those kind of variables. Okay, shall we go on to the next paper, the last paper? All right, Domingo. All right, my name is you look Domingo Molina. I... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I um, will be presenting a paper, a uh, comparison of uh, MIS um, T-lift and uh, decompression for uh, degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis, uh, particularly grade one. <clears throat> Uh, so the objective for this paper, uh, like I said, was to compare the MIS T-lift and MIS decompression. Uh, there are several randomized controlled trials um, and prospective registry studies um, that had somewhat different conclusions on whether the addition of fusion uh, was beneficial and uh, had better patient reported outcomes. Uh, and particularly as we move forward uh, with newer technologies, MIS, uh, procedures um, are becoming uh, more favorable, uh, particularly uh, decreased blood loss, uh, lower narcotic use, uh, decreased length of stay. Uh, so this paper uh, was a, uh, again, a perspective uh, multi-center, uh, multidisciplinary registry study um, out of the uh, quality outcomes database. Uh, it was 12 sites. Uh, they queried patients uh, from J July of 2014 to June 2016, uh, used only uh, patients that had a posterior approach uh, for a grade one spondy. Uh, the patients uh, must have had either percutaneous screws, uh, wilty plane MIS, uh, inner body grass placed, or uh, tubular decompressions. Uh, many patients that had a higher grade spondy or uh, open surgical component uh, were excluded. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the outcomes, uh, again, they uh, analyzed a variety of patient-reported outcomes, the primary one being uh, ODI, uh, 24 months, and then secondary outcomes uh, were the NRS back pain, leg pain, um, and the EQ uh, 5D and NAS satisfaction questionnaire, um, all at 24 months as well. <laughs> uh, so... In the results, uh, they had uh, 608 patients. Um, only 143 of these had posterior-based MIS techniques. Uh, approximately 50% had MIS T-lift, and the uh, rest had MIS uh, decompressions. Again, these were uh, tubular decompressions. Uh, the MIS T-lift patients um, were younger, uh, 72 uh, average age versus 62 um, average age of years. At 24 months, the T-lift group did have fewer operations, um, and this was significant. And the MIS T-lift group did have greater uh, mean ODI change, and they also had greater NRS back pain change and uh, overall superior satisfaction. Uh, there was no difference in um, between the two groups in regards to a change in leg pain or EQ um, 5D score. <laughs> Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and this keeps coming up, uh, and it's a common theme uh, throughout these articles, that employment preoperatively was associated with uh, superior ODI change, um, as well as some of the other patient-reported outcomes. Uh, diabetes uh, was associated with inferior ODI change, as well as uh, patients presented with the dominant symptom of back pain. Uh, this also led to inferior uh, ODI changes as well. <clears throat> Uh, so, again, as we said, uh, MIS T-lift, uh, again, was associated with super outcomes, so fusion versus decompression alone, uh, particularly in this case, uh, use uh, the use of uh, percutaneous screws or wilty plane uh, inner body grafts uh, versus tubular decompressions. Uh, they had a lower rate of reoperation with MIS T-lift, 
Um, again, dominant pain, uh, presenting symptom of back pain was associated with less improvement. Um, and then again, as we said, diabetes and unemployment um, is usually a common theme in patients that have uh, impure outcomes. Uh, some limitations of the study it was a retrospective review or prospective registry. Um, we know that there's many different systems out there for MIST lifts and different techniques, um, as well as uh, tubular decompressions as well. Uh, we both know, we know that the, both the T-lift and the uh, tubular decompression, there's lots of nuances to these uh, procedures. Um, there could be a destabilization of the spine during tubular decompression if uh, you know, you're not aware of uh, how much facet you're taking. Um, perhaps you took most of the facet. Um, so this could uh, be reason why uh, there were re higher reoperation rates in the uh, decompression uh, cohort. Um, and then they didn't use any post operator graphs to uh, determine fusion. So we know that T lifts, uh, some centers, um, in particular residency, we did uh, primarily T lifts for um, spondylolisthesis uh, correction and fusion. Um, some places advocate for more of an anterior approach. Uh, so obviously fusion uh, rate uh, would be a determining factor. So in my practice, uh, you know, again, uh, I think it's all about patient stratification uh, to begin with. So uh, employment status, uh, patient comorbidity status, you know, do they have diabetes? Um, what's their dominant presenting symptom? If it's primarily back pain, uh, we know, you know, just throughout our experience in spine that sometimes patients come with back pain, they're going to have some sort of back pain following their procedure. Uh, so maybe stratifying uh, somebody in that category to maybe decompression alone versus um, having a fusion. Um, so I think that uh, obviously patient selection, um, you know, is really uh, important in uh, how well your patients do and some of these patient reported outcomes. So. <clears throat> All right. You hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, if I can comment. Uh, my comment is going to be very predictable because I said it before to to our guys, but maybe we'll get some reaction from the uh, the uh, Seattle group. I think Jens has heard me say this at the Mazama meeting many times. Uh, obviously, the purpose of surgically treating degenerative spondy with stenosis is decompression, fusion, and then rebuild lordosis because a lot of the times you've lost your lordosis. Most of those are at four, five, and five, one, where you kind of need a, your lordosis rebuilt. So I'll quote my friend Matt Scott Young from Australia. We were at a symposium talking about anterior reconstruction. Someone asked about TLF and being an Aussie, and they're not very subtle people. He said that's the most effing stupid operation he's ever heard of. So what do you, what's the goal of it? Decompression, unless you're really facile, like Peter Derman in our group, and I'm sure you have some of yours, it's really hard to do a good decompression through a tube. Fusion, you certainly can post lateral fusion, and the type of inner body graft you can put in through a tube is not very robust. And then recreating lordosis, I've seen a lot of great x-rays immediately post-ops saying, see, look through my tube if I recreated lordosis, and then six months later, they're back and flat again. So that's, that's kind of where I come from. Do you guys do a lot of minimally invasive T lifts in, in Seattle, or are you more uh, using other approaches? Uh, we do kind of, um, so I do a lot of lateral. Uh, Jeff Rowe does a lot of minimally invasive, um, and then Jens does open. So we sort of do. Um, we do the entire spectrum, but I agree. I mean, I think the goal should be to decompress, fuse, um, and realign. Those are the three objectives. 
I, I steadfastly believe that uh, doing the surgery that you're most comfortable with and uh, not the technique that uh, is currently all vogue or pushed by industry uh, should be what you're doing and that patients will do well if you respect their soft tissues and their bone. What I'm horrified by, especially in the era of MIS is that there's this reflexive um, uh, push towards fusing. Uh, I was on a, from an unnamed company, on a virtual uh, uh, tech talk yesterday. And again, a very facile surgeon with robotics showed how he's putting equipment in here and there. And it's all done through a couple of poke holes. And I was just baffled by the, uh, I mean, any little semi-dark disc uh, got hardware in there and some robotically placed screws and cages. And that's, again, one of those things where our specialty will be judged upon and will fall short of. When we do this kind of an overuse of uh, instrumentation based on some MRI findings without looking at the patient. And again, if you're doing a really good job and do a thorough job and do it a clean and nice fashion uh, in a well-selected patient, uh, this is one of the most gratifying things uh, that we can do, and this is why I'm in the specialty. So I, I place less credo on the MIS versus open. I'm proud to be in a group where we have uh, absolutely dedicated MIS people, and I'm uh, unabashedly still doing my, my traditional open procedures. Listen, we're a little bit over. Uh, but I think it was a great journal club, and I think that uh, it was a great trial. And hopefully, if Jack work his magic with the other ones, we will have a, a much bigger group. We'll see how it goes. But uh, be safe, and thank you, Seattle, and thank you, all the Dallas folks, and, and be good. Thanks. Well done, TBI fellows. Everybody stay safe. Yep. Good job. This is Absolutely. Be good in Seattle. So next week, we'll, we're hopefully going to have a whole bunch of other centers, and one of them will be presenting a journal club. And either next week or the week after, we're going to start dialing in an interesting case conference, and we'll rotate that around center to center, um, each center getting to pick uh, their uh, champion for that week. And the fellows will present a couple cases pertinent to it, and then some interesting cases, and hopefully get involvement from as many as maybe eight centers that are participating. So if uh, Seattle Science Foundation to work for magic. We'll try to get that dialed in in the next week or two. So I just want to end up also. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for uh, Rick and Izzy and uh, Scott and TBI. The TBI fellows, you do a great job. I really like those articles. Everyone was thought provoking, well commented on. So kudos to you. Our fellows enjoyed them also quite a lot. And uh, looking forward to next iterations. And uh, finally, thank you to Alexis and Lee and Linda from the uh, SSF to, uh, for facilitating this kind of a great new communication era. Have a great day. Yes. Thank you, Yes, kudos to all the SS folks. They've, they're great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.